The border between India's northeastern state of Assam and the independent kingdom of Bhutan runs right through the Manas Tiger Reserve. Manas is home to 21 endangered species living in its rivers, grasslands and forests. Its 50,000 hectares are not only a vital national park but also a world heritage site. But in recent years, Manas has suffered from illegal poaching and timber smuggling. More than a dozen wildlife guards have been murdered in the local people's, the Bodo's, fight for autonomy. The monsoon dictates the many moods of Manas. From June until September, over two meters of rain falls. The Manas River floods and fertilizes the grasslands with silt. In opening up new channels, the river erodes banks and topples trees, acting as a natural check on woodlands that might otherwise spread and take over the grassland. At last, the river falls, leaving an entire network of channels six to seven kilometers wide. The Manas River, the first of the reserve's three key habitats, changes within weeks of the monsoon ending from turbulent to tranquil. In a newly formed channel, a little egret tries to catch marcia fry, which are being rounded up by two magansas. A smooth Indian otter hunts along a newly deposited bank of silt. Manas is one of the last places where it's possible to find truly wild Asiatic buffalo. Elsewhere, they've interbred with domestic water buffalo. They're heavily dependent on the riverside grasslands and use the rocky islands in midstream as resting places, especially at night. There's no cover there, so they feel safe from tigers. They graze on the algae that grows along the banks in the dry season and wallow in the heat of the day to cool off. Manas is visited by a fluctuating population of over a thousand elephants as many as you can find in the whole of Sri Lanka. The Asian elephant, almost everywhere else, is in considerable danger. There probably aren't more than 50,000 left, all told. Spread of human population is invariably the cause. At Manas, this isn't a problem. The herds cross freely between the Indian and Bhutan sides of the reserve as the seasons dictate, just as they've always done. The cutting of such traditional migration routes is one of the main causes of elephant decline elsewhere. Until now, the rangers at Manas have managed to control poaching. It's one of the few places where you can still find a big tusker carrying huge ivory. The herd moves away from the river into the second of Manas's three main habitats, the alluvial grasslands. 
Once the dry season comes, some part of this grassland is always hidden under a pall of smoke. The management plan for the reserve calls for burning in a patchwork pattern a section at a time. Setting fire to old grass is standard practice for encouraging new grass to come through. In the old days, all the grassland was set alight in one glorious blaze. The new policy, begun by the reserve's director in the late 70s, produces a cooler burn and allows some of the old grass to remain as cover for animals while new shoots begin to break through. The black drongos are taking advantage of the system to catch insects disturbed by the fire. The chief benefactors, however, are not the birds, but rare grassland animals who can feed on tender new grass while being able to hide from their enemies among the still standing stalks of the old. The effectiveness of the system is clear here. This area has already been burnt. The swamp deer are almost completely hidden by the surviving stems, yet they're able to find new grass at ground level. The Bengal florican has benefited greatly from the burning program. It used to be a common bird in India, but destruction of grassland elsewhere has made it increasingly rare. The males exhibit a most remarkable courtship display. A hog deer, the most common of Manassas four deer species, remains completely unmoved by the performance. A successful male chases a rival away. You seldom see the hen bird. She spends her time watching from thick cover where she's perfectly camouflaged. The display usually starts in April, two months before the arrival of the monsoon. Later, the savannah where the florican nests will be underwater. When rival males wander into a dominant male's territory, there's invariably a sparring match. When his two rivals have been persuaded to leave, the resident male puts on an impressive aerial display to settle the affair. Migrants, like this blue throat, pass through Manas before the monsoon arrives. The real triumph of the modern burning policy is the reappearance of the pygmy hog. It's a wild boar in miniature. Adults stand only 25 centimeters high at the shoulders. The hogs are usually hidden by grass many times that height. The pygmy hog is now only found in Assam. Dry season burning elsewhere has destroyed the grassy swamplands which the hogs prefer.
In 1990, Manas had a population of around 100 Indian one-horned rhinoceros. Poaching by large, well-armed gangs has reduced this figure to about a dozen. Only half of the 40 or so guard posts are now manned because of the political unrest. The remaining handful of rhinos could be completely wiped out before too long. Not only animals, but some plants benefit from the recent burning practices. Wild orchids bloom after the burn. Woodlands are essential to the gaur, the so-called Indian bison. These huge beasts, a bull stands nearly two meters at the shoulders, are really hill animals. The foothills and forests of Manas suit them perfectly, especially when the grass is sprouting. Gaur are usually shy, but a bull will sometimes charge without provocation. After the monsoon, the trees flame with blossom. It's then that you appreciate the richness and color of the bird life of Manas, especially the nectar feeders, such as the blue-throated barbets. Grey bulbuls. A rarity, a great Himalayan barbet. A grey-headed miner feeds on the flowers of the coral tree. A fairy bluebird. A nearby bombax tree attracts a rose-ringed parakeet a red-vented bulbul, and a jungle miner. Deeper in the woodlands, the bombax blossoms attract considerably larger feeders. These are capped langers. Unlike the common langer, which is very adaptable and is even found around villages, the capped langers seldom leave their treetop shelter. Because of this, they're extremely vulnerable to the destruction of their woodland habitat. The capped langers are only found on the Indian side of Manas, apparently because they're unable to cross the river to Bhutan. They feed on leaves, fruits and flowers. They don't even come down to ground level to drink at the numerous streams. Their vegetarian diet supplies them with all the moisture they need. The giant hornbills nest and roost mainly on the Indian side of the reserve. Most mornings, when the fruits are ripe on the Bhutan side, they fly across the river to feed there. Not only birds, but people can cross freely from one side of the reserve to the other. There's complete cooperation between India and Bhutan at Manas. Across the river, in the Bhutan woodlands, the langas are pure gold in color. They're a remarkable sight. The golden langer was not discovered until 1953 by the British naturalist EPG. They only exist in an area 12 kilometers long between the Manas and Sankosh rivers. As far as we know, this beautiful monkey doesn't live anywhere else in the world. 
Like their less decorative cousins, the cap langers on the Indian side of the river, they hardly ever descend to the ground. They're completely arboreal, like the very large rodent which shares the treetops with them, the Malayan giant squirrel. How the golden langer escaped notice for so long in what is a fairly well explored area is a complete mystery. The scientific world took some time to get over the shock. When it did, it named the new species Presbytis gi, in honor of its discoverer. The golden langer's treetop neighbor, the Malayan giant squirrel, is nearly a meter long from nose to tail tip. It's an extremely shy animal, generally silent, unlike the langers who make an unearthly din, shrieking and barking whenever they spot anything suspicious. The fascination of Manas is its variety of species, mood and habitat. The hornbills forays after food, take them into the richest habitat of all, the dense forest. A macaque feeds close by. The orchids of the forest are even more magnificent than those of the grasslands. The forest swarms with life. Strange insects and small mammals like the hoary-bellied squirrel. A blue-throated barbet pokes its head from a nest hole, just like a woodpecker. A true woodpecker excavates its own nest hole nearby. The ancestor of every domestic chicken in the world, the red jungle fowl, struts in a clearing, unaware of the service its species has done humankind. Samba are deer of the deep forest, but during the hot season they emerge to cool off in the pools left by the shrinking Manas River. Others have the same idea. Tigers feel the heat more than any other big cat because they originally evolved in the cold climate of North and Central Asia. This female scent marks before melting away into the forest once again. She's wary. She knows there's a male around, but isn't yet receptive to him. Yeah. 
The reserve holds one of the highest densities of tigers anywhere on the subcontinent. Their protection has largely been due to Project Tiger, founded by the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Poaching still occurs, but at a much reduced level. Continued political unrest still poses a grave threat to Manas. Unless this problem is resolved quickly, the long-term future of Manas could be seriously at risk. <laughs> 